We start off with a Fed punch in the gut. Stocks tanking today with the tech trade really taking on the chin. Take a look at the Nasdaq 100. Only a handful of names posting gains in today's broad-based sell-off. Check out what happened in the Treasury market. Bonds getting battered. Yield rocketing higher. The 10-year soaring above 1.7. All this as we learned exactly what went down behind closed doors at December's Fed meeting. Let's get right to Steve Leisman with the fallout. Steve, you know what's interesting is we had that Fed meeting. We talked about it. A couple weeks ago, they had the press conference. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And here we have the minutes, and, and things really seem to, to change in terms of the market perception. Well, we did learn new details, Melissa. And those details are at the December meeting suggesting that the Federal Reserve is going to be more aggressive now uh, in reducing its $9 trillion balance sheet than we previously thought. It highlights really the growing concern with inflation. And, of course, as you know, it really pressured equities and bonds today. So the minutes didn't put a timetable on when the Fed might begin the runoff. It's, by the way, not actually scheduled to stop buying assets until next month. Might be some of the confusion out there. But some think the runoff could happen or begin happening as soon as this summer. Kathy Bastiansik from Oxford, she wrote today, the hawkish tone of the minutes underscores the likelihood of three rate hikes this year, but also signals a reduction in the size of the balance sheet that could start by mid-2022. The minutes also suggest the possibility of faster rate hikes. Markets are now dialing in a better than 70 percent chance to actually make it 73 percent chance of the first hike coming in March <clears throat> and high probabilities of a second hike in June, a third in November and a not insignificant 40 percent probability now of a fourth hike in December. Some officials even said in the minutes they prefer to rely more on balance sheet reduction than rate hikes to remove accommodation. This would avoid flattening the curve on the, out, on the longer term. It also suggests, by the way, a faster pace of tightening. It's well to underscore, folks, the absurdity of the moment. The Fed is talking about aggressively reducing its balance sheet while it is still adding assets to that balance sheet. It's just a Fed that may be behind its own curve, Melissa. Hmm. Steve, thank you. Steve Leisman. Brian Kelly, what did you make of today's action? And we, we know what the Fed said behind closed doors yeah. at this point. It's funny, when you take a look back at how the market interpreted Powell's press conference on the day of the Fed meeting in December, everything was dovish. Tech stocks were rallying. It was like a relief yeah. rally there. Yeah, I, so there's some things that the Fed has done really well and some things the Fed has done really poorly. What Chair Powell has done really well has been able to uh, assuage the market and play the market and uh, convince the market that they are not going to be crushing the economy. What they've done poorly and horribly is actually call the economy. Remember, when we had housing prices going through the roof, we had jobs all of a sudden taking off. The economy was soaring. It was reopening. And the Federal Reserve decided to keep on the gas pedal. Now, when things are starting to slow down, supply chain issues are hurting profits. You're seeing ISM numbers start to roll over globally. Now, they want to raise rates at the worst time uh, that you could actually do it. It's probably the wrong time. They're wrong about transitory. They'll probably be wrong about that. So great, BK went on a rant about the Fed. What does that mean to trade, right? So right now the market is going to price in how aggressive the Fed's going to be and are they going to induce a recession? Because that's really the only tool they have. And so what you saw today was repositioning. It wasn't very disorderly at all. It seemed to be pretty natural and a repositioning trade here. So you are now short bonds. You don't want to be long U.S. equity, U.S. bonds anymore. That's going to hurt uh, high multiple stocks. And so you want to stay away from those. And you probably want to go into the more boring things. You, you want to look at the defenses and those type of things until this settles out. Yeah. Guy, what did you make of it? And, and the change in the Fed in what we learned today and how it was interpreted, does it also have to do with the backdrop of today, where we are today with Omicron versus where we were in December? It, today, we have a lot more data in terms of how extensive it is. China actually has shutdowns there in its in its factory cities. Um, we have a little bit more color on how it's impacting the economies. Yeah, but the Fed, I think, is saying in terms of Omicron, you know, damn the torpedoes mm -hmm. full speed ahead. And they're probably right to do that, by the way. Again, we look at things through the lens of the markets and we're not making light of anything going on in the health front, obviously. But in terms of that, I think the markets have learned to look past uh, the variants, and, and quite frankly, they should. With that said, the Fed is saying, you know what, maybe we did get this wrong. Neil Kashkari, by the way, who's probably one of the more dovish uh, members out there, actually talked about it yesterday, saying, you know what, this inflation is a bit of a problem. 
much more of a problem than we thought. And he sees two rate hikes this year. So you have some of the most dovish people turning hawkish. Now, I think that's the right course of action. And if the market's going to go down on the back of it, that's just collateral damage. And that's exactly what James Gorman said a couple weeks ago when he did that interview with Wilf, if you go back and listen to it. So, mm -hmm. look, it might not be pleasant for the market, but I think in terms of what they need to do, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Was this just fuel to the fire of the rotation we've already seen happening in front of us, Steve? Yeah, and I think it's odd, kind of ironic that Sarah tossed to, to, uh, to the show saying that COVID stimulus is being talked about. How ironic is that? We're going to have, do you think that we could be in an environment, rhetorical question, do you think we could be in an environment where we are talking about and discussing and implementing COVID stimulus and raising rates? My guess is no. So now the market is going to digest all of this. Do you raise rates or do you reduce the balance sheet and which one is worse? Steve Leisman said that reducing the balance sheet might not be as bad. So for me, I think, yes, we, we're all in agreement um, or, or, or uh, basically leaning this way. Value should outperform. I thought it could start to outperform literally at the change of the calendar. We got that. Where does it go from here? The whole market is going to move lower. Saw that today. Value went lower. Growth went lower. Because value is not a big enough percentage of the index. <laughs> What happens in the next six months? I don't know. What does COVID do? What is Powell thinking going into midterms? And I know it's not a political age, uh, organization, Melissa, but he does not want to be responsible for a 15% in, a drop in the market. I think we're talking about something completely different a week from now, and I think the markets digest this very quickly. Well, a 15% drop in the market may mean that he doesn't raise rates as soon as we think. So <laughs> there's sort of this, this weird sort of, you know, cycle going on here, Jeff. And I think the question here in terms of the overall markets, though, is, you know, we've, we've seen that clear rotation out of the growthy high valuation names. That is undeniable. The Pelotons, the Snowflakes, et cetera. But should it extend to the likes of an Alphabet? Should it extend to the likes of a Microsoft, which we did see today? It was indiscriminate in terms of technology. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And thinking about the Googles and Apples of the world, even Amazons, I mean, it's a little baby out with the bathwater today. And I know we've talked about this over and over again, but you do have to differentiate between these really high multiple unprofitable companies and then those names that we're all very familiar with. So I do think that this creates an opportunity for some of those names. And I've talked about this before, too, but especially as we push into the middle part of this year, I think investors are going to continue to look for this profitable growth as the economy starts to slow down. Uh, and to go back to what BK said a little bit, you know, I think the Fed rhetoric today, the hawkishness, continues to become more and more out of step with reality as we move through the year. I agree with Guy as well that they should be hiking, but maybe they should have already hiked. I think the, the missing the window narrative is, is really appropriate here. And we saw some signs in the PMI data yesterday. Supplier delivery times came down. Prices paid came down. Inventories are starting to build. These should all be headwinds to inflation. And then the economy starts to roll over a little bit. PMIs have come off the boil. So I think that makes it very difficult for the Fed to actually move forward in a way that's consistent with three or four rate hikes this year. So I think we're in a situation now where you want to be in value. You want to be in cyclicals. We talked about this at the end of the year. Financials, energy, oversold, and they're the two best sectors so far this year. So I would hunker down there for the time being as the market digests this. But again, as you move into that second half of the year when the economy starts to slow, perhaps we have some really good opportunities in these more fundamentally sound tech names.